Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Jeff DeGraff, financial markets have always been about figuring out who moved the pieces in a chess match and why. Early exposure to the discipline of technical analysis and its focus on prices and probabilities helped Jeff begin to develop a framework that concentrates on finding bets with favorable odds. Our discussion considers the market events that have played a formative role in how Jeff thinks about risk. Particularly influential among the big events was the LTCM debacle, especially as it illustrated the power of the Fed to bring an end to a de-risking process. A decade after founding Renaissance Macro in 2011, Jeff and his team continue to view the policy response as both inevitable and critical. And in this context, we discuss the evolution of the interaction between markets and the central bank. Today's much more activist Fed is one example of how historical pricing relationships, while a valuable tool to understand the present, must be interpreted with care. The shifting correlation profile of the treasury market to various segments of the equity market is a ready example of this change. For Jeff, predicting the future is difficult and time is better spent on the study of price. Here his process leads him to a lengthy checklist of indicators that allow the market to speak. And while in his words, the market fibs often, a wide enough swath of charts across the asset classes and geographies is bound to provide clues on where both value and vulnerability are hiding. Lastly, we talk about life on the sell side and Jeff's perspective on running a client-centric business through the pandemic. Here, the take is an optimistic one, with Jeff and team deriving value from connecting with clients virtually in order to deliver insights in an efficient manner. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Jeff DeGraff. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Jeff DeGraff. He is the founder and CEO of Renaissance Macro Research, a boutique broker dealer here in New York City. Jeff, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Dean. Well, we'll have a lot to talk about just around the here and now and all of the work that you and your firm do on the micro of pricing and relative value and the interaction between just different sectors and how they work with interest rates. As we start the conversation, it'd be great to get acquainted with the early days of your career, how you came about to establish yourself in the industry. Tell us about how you got started in the industry. I majored in finance from Michigan State University, which was not a hotbed of recruiting for investment banks by any means back in the late 80s and early 90s. And I always knew I had an interest in financial markets, and I can't even really put my finger on how or why or where, but it was always something that sort of resonated with me. And I think the big part was I just saw that industry evolve or what was happening within the industry evolving all the time where Every day that people woke up, it was a chess match and somebody had moved the pieces while you were sleeping and you had to figure out sort of what the next move was. And that always resonated with me as sort of the intellectual curiosity and staying on top of things and just being a part of the world as it was turning. So I started out in, I mean, the first thing I wanted to do was get the heck out of Michigan in the cold winter. So I moved to San Francisco and started trading bonds out there, ended up at Merrill Lynch where really I discovered technical analysis. I did not go to technical analysis school or anything along those lines. And it really just sort of resonated with me from a probabilistic standpoint and sort of the way I always thought about the world, which was thinking in terms of bets. And technical analysis just was sort of that thinking. It was a little bit of blackjack and how do you put the odds in your favor and where do you lean in and where do you pull back? And that just really stood out to me. So that was my trajectory And then I went over to Lehman Brothers in 1998, about a month and a half prior to long-term capital management, which you remember. In fact, you also are a Lehman alum. And that was pretty dark days there for a while during long-term capital. And I remember telling my direct report, I'm like, hey, I didn't burn any bridges at Merrill. I could go back over there if this thing's circling the drain. I said, no, no, things are fine. Things are fine. I think, you know, as I look back, and I know one thing that we talked about was what were influential periods of your career. And I really think long-term capital was one of them just to see. And I always knew and appreciated, but I don't think to the extent that we saw really probably starting with long-term capital, how influential and important the Fed is when 
they decide to come in and sort of support markets, just how good and effective they are at that. So that was sort of my trajectory and was at Lehman for about 10 years, went to ISI, which was a macro boutique at the time, it has obviously evolved into ISI Evercore. And I just wanted to stay sharp and stay macro focused and started RenMac 10 years ago in March. So it's been a decade now that we've been on our own and really enjoy it. Working with great people, very concentrated on what we do, but really smart, really passionate people. And that's a lot of fun. Well, congrats on the 10 year anniversary on the sell side. That's no small feat these days. Let's circle back to LTCM. As you said, we were colleagues at the time and I was covering long-term capital. And it really was formative for me as well, because I, even though I went to the University of Chicago and was a student of efficient markets, really thought that these folks had just figured it out, that those returns were just an indication that they were that much smarter than everybody else. There's no way you could make those kinds of returns. And of course, really in the aftermath, we learned that the risk profile was just incredibly significant in terms of the amount of risk they had on the sheets. What were the types of pricing movements just from your technical framework, which I really want to dive into because you talk about probability analysis. And I think that'll be a great thing for us to talk more about. But insofar as LTCM, we had some pretty big divergences and things like swap spreads and so forth. What are some of the lessons that you took away or some of the observations from that specific risk episode? You hit the nail on the head. I mean, credit is such an important part of this business. It always has been, always will be, in in my opinion, and probably continues to get underlooked or underappreciated, particularly from equity investors. And I would say not necessarily the macro investors, but those that are silo or sector specialists or individual company analysts or industry analysts, just the appreciation of how important credit is. And I would say in terms of sort of live bullets, one of the things that really resonated with me, and this happens a lot in what I do, we look at so many different things, currencies and commodities and credit and equities, and we do it globally. And there's oftentimes a point where you sort of put this or create this pile that says, what is going on here? So when you're looking at the price action, you can see something is happening, but it's not always easy to build the narrative around it. And we sort of do things, we reverse engineer the world, if you will, by looking at price first and then trying to figure out what the heck the story is. And a lot of people look at the story first and then expect price to follow. And that just never really sat well with us because it's a pretty difficult thing to do to predict the future and try to react and plan accordingly. So one of the things that really stood out to us was what was happening in sovereign debt, global sovereign debt at the time. And obviously that was part of that fuse, if you will, that was burning down to eventually the crisis that was long-term capital management. And that was the same thing that happened back in 07. I remember I transitioned from Lehman Brothers in February of 07 to ISI. And one of the things that we were seeing as we sort of started at this new shop was these spreads were starting to really, really come unglued in the credit markets, even though equities were really pretty complacent and calm at the time. And the swap spreads just continued to rise. And it went from 10s down to 5s down to 2s. And I sat there with my guys. I'm like, something's going to go kaboom. And I don't know where it is or what it is, but there's something that's not right. And about a week and a half, two weeks later, it was the Bear Stearns failure to get funding on, I think it was their internal hedge fund. The mortgage hedge fund, I'm like, aha, there's sort of at least some of the dry powder that's going off here. That's probably the challenge from my world is we can see things often ahead of the consensus, but it's very hard to build the narrative because they're usually such thin slices of the pie that having that expertise or finding the person who has the expertise that's in the middle of it can be relatively challenging to really get to the meat of the story. So But that's the one thing I took away from long-term capital was, hey, if you keep a broad and diverse list of charts, and frankly, to go through the global indices and global charts from the commodities to the currencies and the like without getting stock specific, but even within sectors, you can do that with a pretty effective scan on a weekend within an hour. And it just gives you a pretty good sense as to what's happening and whether everything's in gear. Or like I said, the pile that you put that says, hey, something's not right here. Now let's take the time to figure it out. It's so interesting and important to be trying to gather these cross-market signals. And it's certainly the case that 
different asset classes respond to various events, maybe at different speeds or just differently. And I'm also recalling the middle part of 2007, I was working with some of the folks on the credit side to do some credit hedging. I was in equity derivatives and the degree of alarm that was there in plain sight on that floor relative to the S&P, which hit a new all-time high in Q3 of 07, was just a staggering disconnect. It really was fascinating and humbling to see how dislocated these markets can be. So you mentioned your period at ISI through the crisis and then starting RENMAC in and around 2011. That was also a mini crisis. It's really the 10-year anniversary of not just the founding of RENMAC, but the Eurozone debt crisis, the US debt ceiling showdown that occurred in August of 2011 brought about a lot of volatility. Assets became incredibly correlated. What was that like, if you can remember, in terms of starting the firm amidst a pretty healthy level of the VIX? I think it reached in the mid-40s in late 2011. We have a, and I'm sure you see the same thing in your business, we sort of have this unique ability to be very popular during tumultuous times. So for the business, it's usually good news. Bull markets, everybody's a rocket scientist in a bull market, so they don't need any help. It's always in the bear markets where they ask questions. So the more volatility generally, the better our business is. And frankly, those are more exciting times for us because like anything, they present opportunities both on the short side and the long side. And so I think one of the things that we're actually very good at is parsing through and figuring out what the one or two big drivers are in any given market and then trying to steer people accordingly to what will do well in those environments and then coming out of those environments. And there's a certain cadence to the market. There's a certain predictability from a policy response standpoint and the like. And so helping to create that framework and again, back to long-term capital or even probably 11 years prior to that, which was the crash of 1987, which was really probably the first institution of the Greenspan put, starting to understand what these policy responses are, how far the dislocation has to go before you expect that the policy responses take place. But all those are part of that calculus. But generally speaking, back in those early days of RENMAC, and we had a very good policy analyst who had actually come out of the Obama administration at Treasury and so was very familiar with the workings of the world. It was certainly helpful in helping us guide and understand the policy reactions and some of the initiatives that take place. And then I always find it interesting from an economic perspective, it always feels like economists want to create a narrative around policy versus sort of true blue economics. If there's ever a discipline, I think, with as many opinions as there are facts, it's economics. But there's a certain line, I call it the physics of economics, that you just can't deviate too much from. And we saw that with the sovereign debt crisis in Europe where basically they were mutualizing the debt risk. And that just doesn't go on forever. Those things just can't happen forever. And so seeing sort of how these policies are reactionary and what the flaws are, and they don't come to fruition right away, but just understanding how that pendulum is going to swing. And then at what point when that pendulum breaks, do you want to get back and play it on the other side is always something that we like to do. And I would just say from my career One of the things I always like to look at is finding places where the free market is not really allowed to act. And that can be a currency peg, that can be that mutualization of debt, just anything where the policymakers sort of believe that they can defy the law of physics or free markets. I always look at as an opportunity eventually that the risk is going to pile up on the opposite side just in a manner that is unsustainable and will have a pretty sharp rebound. And those are always great opportunities in this business. That's a fascinating comment. And we can circle back at the latter part of the call. We'll talk about a 1.3% nominal treasury yield set against five plus percent inflation and the central bank buying the treasury's bonds almost ad infinitum. But when we think about both the GFC and maybe the sovereign is just a mini version of it, but certainly the pandemic is a big version of it. The drawdowns are so significant. They're so sharp. And the destruction of capital is so significant that if you can get out of the way in some way, shape, or form, that's going to save you a lot. But of course, missing the bottom, that the gains from the bottom, and I think you frame it really well, which is inevitably the policy response is coming. The Fed, the government, they're not going to let the system burn to the ground. They believe in the wealth effect. 
They believe in the systemic risk contagion that can occur. And so you don't want to miss the bottom either. How do you kind of square those two? To miss the bottom is very damaging, but also to absorb those gigantic drawdowns is damaging as well. How do you think about that kind of two sides of those? Just as a general rule, without the deterioration of credit, we don't find playing for the crash makes an awful lot of sense. Like they say in the lottery business, somebody has to win. Okay, that's true, <laughs> but, but it never seems to be me. <laughs> and so when I think about crash risk, I always frame it within the credit cycle, because that's really where it becomes the most acute and obviously can be the most severe. And look, I've been in this business for 30 years, as you have, and we hear people and know people that are always calling for a crash, always calling for a crash to the point where it just doesn't make any difference. If you get one right out of 20, what's the point? Or 100, it's just not effective. We try to steer it and like anything else, we just think in terms of bets. What's the probability here? What's the probability there? And the probability is usually the highest when we have some type of inflationary bubble. Now, that what's interesting around that is that that can be both a product of prices through the PPI or CPI or however you want to measure it, but it can also be through asset prices. And it tends to be that combination because the Fed's focused on the consumer inflation or the producer inflation, and they're less concerned with the asset inflation. Now, that might have changed a little bit with the housing crash, but consistently, they seem to watch and react more to the general economic inflation. We think about it in terms of, is this the point where the Fed is likely to start taking away the punch bowl? Because that, as Warren Buffett has infamously said, is the point where the tide goes out and you can see who's wearing the bathing suit. That's the point where the crash or the contraction in balance sheets, is, which is the way that we think about it, is the most likely. So in terms of something like COVID, we didn't capture that crash. We talked about sentiment being excessive. We talked about some deterioration, but in no way, shape, or form when I pat ourselves on the back and saying that we called the crash. What we did see, though, was at the bottom, and I mean right within hours of the bottom, were a lot of the signposts that we look for, excessive sentiment, fear on television and in the media, to the point of being sort of irrational, if you will, and then a very, very accommodative liquidity response from not only the monetary side, which is not that unusual, but also the fiscal side, and really just lining things up and saying, boy, this, in, in fact, in many ways, we likened it to 19. 98 after long-term capital, but with the help of fiscal policy in this in this instance. And obviously, we had a huge rebound in response from that. And we continue to ride that wave in, in some way, shape, or form, obviously, without as much momentum as we had there. But it's that combination of people... I always love to hear the Fed's out of bullets or the Fed doesn't matter this time or what. And at some point, maybe that will happen. But that's going to be a point at which the world basically would be coming to an end, in our view, if they get to that. But the charter, if we look at the charter of the Fed and what the reaction function is today versus when you and I got in the business, I mean, it's a completely different animal than what we saw 30 years ago. The idea or the notion that they're buying corporate investment grade debt, quantitative easing, just some of these things are really just a brand new script for the Fed. And I think that's an important thing to not only understand and internalize, but you have to stay sharp and see exactly what some of these new mechanisms are and what their impacts are. Well, that's a great point. And that has me thinking as you presented this probability framework, which I'd love to just learn a little bit more about. But as you talk about the new script, things are new in markets. And so what I'm curious about is you're using a lot of data. You're using that to create some probability distribution of outcomes based on the past in terms of overlaying that on the present. But at the same time, the script is different. The actors are different. The innovation is different. Of course, the remit of the central bank seems to have changed over time. And so to analyze the data in a vacuum is a little difficult. How do you combine that quantitative discipline with maybe a qualitative overlay that reflects that things are different, things do change over time? It's a great point. And I would say that it's sort of always been the case. It's easy to look back in history and say, well, it's this is sort of the trajectory. But one of the ways that, or one of the things that we do when we look at data, particularly data over the last 50 years, is we look at the consistency of a basically a rolling T-stat 
and how consistent has that T-stat been? I'll give you a great example, which is yields and equity markets. That T-stat has gone from being statistically significant with a positive coefficient to statistically significant with a negative coefficient. What are you supposed to do with that? So is it lying to us today or was it lying to us the previous 40 years? We always look at sort of what is the stability of the T-stack in the past to understand how likely it is that it'll be useful going forward. And that's pretty fascinating when you go through and look at the data and say, okay, well, how do I want to think about things? Because you'll find there are plenty of examples where the relationship not only has become more or less significant, but it may have actually flip-flopped from being significant in one direction to significant in the exact opposite direction. And so that's one of the things that we do to really understand. Now, it's fine. You can say, hey, look, this is important today, but I need to rely less on it because I'm not sure if we're going back to the way things were 40 years ago or if we're going to continue on the trajectory as we are today. And we tend to be more trend followers, so we believe in it. But it's like having teenage kids where you want to believe them, but you also want to verify. (laughs) So trust and verify is absolutely the mantra that we have with a lot of that data. Said a man with three sons. I like that. Yes, indeed. So the relationship between the 10-year and the equity market, as you said, it's evolved over time. We went through the long period in the 80s and 90s, which was the Fed pulls away the punch bowl. So lower bond prices, i.e. higher rates, sort of brings about lower equity prices. And now this risk on risk off regime has been more present. But underneath the surface, there's a lot of differentiation as well. And I've seen you've done some work on industry sensitivity to 10-year yields. So I'd love for you to walk through what you see there and then what does it imply for how you recommend clients allocate capital or engage in portfolio construction? One of the things, because of that flip-flop in the significance of yields, and this is pretty interesting when you look at banks as an example. And I think everybody, particularly your audience here, understands this relationship between yields and banks, higher yields, better relative performance for banks. And that's been the case for the last 10 plus years, basically. Prior to the great financial crisis, that relationship really wasn't in existence. If you, again, go back to that T-stat and look at it, banks really didn't care to terribly much or react too much to the 10-year yield, which I thought was pretty interesting. So it's become, I mean, we're talking about T-stats that were very close to zero back in the 80s and 90s and and mid-aughts. And in the last 10 years, that T-stat is six. I mean, six is like, there's almost no doubt that there's some relationship there. Usually you're looking for something that has a T-stat above two to give you some confidence in the relationship. So six is literally just off the charts. And so we'll use, because the market goes through various sensitivities, but try to capture what's most important. And usually it is Fed related when we think that there's a higher probability that we're going to see some move in yields, then we'll use this sensitivity to help to construct those portfolios and try to move people away from things that have that negative relationship to yields and obviously towards things that have the positive relationship to yields. But as you said, I mean, the last 10, 12 years now, we've really seen a remarkable positive relationship between a lot of the cyclical names, a lot of the financial names, energy, and yields. So as yields go higher, which historically you would expect that that starts to actually choke off the economic recovery and that some of these highly cyclical names would come under pressure, that has not been the case in the last 12 years. And in fact, you want a strong and robust yield or bond market decline to support the cyclicals. Now, at some point that becomes anathema to those equities and those industry groups, but generally that's a flattening or an inverting of the curve. So as long as that's steepening, good things tend to happen. At the bottom, in those dark days of March, your indicators are screaming dislocation. They're screaming the odds are really favorable here, even though it's a scary time to allocate capital, that this market's set to rise and perhaps rise significantly. At some point, that levels off, of course. The best part of the gains happen very quickly after a crisis subsides in general. So how does that tend to manifest itself in your indicators? And then by what time does your process tell you, okay, we've seen the better part of the gains here, and perhaps the buying opportunities are just a little less obvious than they were at the bottom in March? So there's things that we look at, which are the percentage of new lows in the market, 
obviously volatility, skew, overall volume, a percentage of volumes in declining issues versus advancing issues, just things that historically give you, and it's just just like a checklist for us. We just go through and say, okay, we've got 80% of these things are lined up. This is good news. And then price is always the most important confirmation that the market's finally reacting to these conditions, if you will, and that's good news. And so we want to make sure that we're joining that party in those extremes. And it was true back in 2009. In fact, I would say the low as we saw it, the internal low for equities was actually in, I want to say it was November of 2008. And that's where the majority of names hit their 52-week low. And even though the market was another 25% lower by March of 2009, very close to that final low, there was a massive improvement in credit for those three months. There was a massive improvement or contraction in the number of new lows. And it was really one of these markets where we're sort of looking at it saying, the market feels terrible, but actually internally, things are pretty good, or they're certainly not as bad as what the reflection is of the indices. And that happened a little bit in March. Obviously, the time frame was not as drawn out as it was back in 08 and 09. But we just basically create this checklist of things that we expect to find at a bottom. And however many of those are checked off, the higher our confidence level is. And then I think a really important thing, and it gets underappreciated because people want to go out and buy the airlines. They want to go out and buy the cruise ships or the restaurants, whatever the case may be. We go right to the new high list. And we don't go to the new high list that was working on the way down, but we go to the new high list that's been working since those conditions really started to present themselves. So it moves you away from the Costco's and it moves you towards some of the application software names, which were really starting to pick up and break out back in the called April and maybe May of 2020. But we go right to the new high list. And then we've also developed a couple of other lists that we use relative performance highs. So not just absolute highs, but what's making a new relative performance high that's outperforming. And those are important parts of that equation. And then from a factor perspective, going back and looking, particularly when the Fed is engaged and in their, what's called the activism state, we know that you want to go with less quality, low quality. And that's exactly the opposite of what people on CNBC are telling me. They're saying, go buy quality, buy quality, buy quality. And I get it. I mean, there's something to that. If in your IRA, okay. But if you're really trying to outperform, the rising tide lifts all boats and it lifts the least seaworthy the fastest. And so the highly levered names, the lower quality names, the lower margin names, they tend to do really, really well out of those. Now, again, you have to differentiate between the sort of scene of the crime, which is those that are impacted directly and those that are coming out of it and going to be beneficiaries like the home building names or the building product names or some of these others, because that's really where that rising tide lifts all boats. And that tends to go for somewhere between three and six months, then it becomes a lot more challenging. So you have three to six months of sort of everything going up, and then it really starts to differentiate itself. And obviously, that took place very close to the election where we started to see energy had a pretty good fourth quarter and first quarter. We had the same for financials as yields started to turn. So it becomes a little bit more challenging once you get six months out. And then In an environment like where we are today, you absolutely have to depend on relative performance because, again, we're still in an uptrend, so a lot of charts are still in very good sort of structural formations, but there is clear differentiation between winners and losers here. You can look at almost any utility, and it's probably in an uptrend, but it hasn't done you any favors for the last 18 months. You've been a persistent dog versus the market, and that's where relative performance becomes so important. You mentioned factor and style characteristics. and This notion of essentially doing the George Costanza opposite of CNBC and actually buying low quality at the bottom, uh, I think that's interesting. And look, we've had forced upon us an entirely new brand of differentiation in terms of equity prices, which is the work from home versus the back to work. And some of those overlap pretty significantly with some style and factor characteristics, some sector characteristics as well. And as you mentioned, the election, it just had me thinking, and I'd love to just get you to riff on this, but I just call it Pfizer vaccine day. And I think it was November 8th or 9th. Trump had to be pretty upset. He's three days the loser in the election and this announcement comes out. But I don't think you've ever seen a dislocation in one day between, let's say, growth and value, banks versus tech. I mean, just absolutely gigantic. And so I'm just curious when you sort of think about that, this notion of back to work and stay at home, and how that overlaps with factors. Talk to us about how that 
works its way into your analysis and process? Disappointingly, not a ton, just because it's so new. But clearly, and I think the way that we've always dealt with these changes is really, again, focusing on relative performance because the market tells us where the winners are and where the losers are. And so the market will fib. There's no doubt about it. The market will tell little white lies and will yank you in and yank you out of a few things, but it doesn't persistently lie. It'll get itself on the right side and continue. And so I think you've seen some of that with software, application software, system software, some of these technologies that have certainly been beneficial. I don't know about your business, but we're still not really traveling a few trips here and there. But even from the client side, there's not a lot of interest in travel or actually being in the office. So even if you go to Atlanta or Denver or Boston or wherever the case may be, that's great, except you've got 20% of the workforce that was there before. So and you're seeing that in terms of the various industry groups and sectors and the performance. So we're less inclined to create baskets of work from home, stay at home, reopen trades, et cetera. We see it and certainly we're sensitive to it. But what we're always trying to do is just focus on the relative strength and then work backwards and say, okay, well, if I look at these names, what is the narrative of these names? And then is there a persistence of this to happen. And I think probably the clearest one or one of the clearest ones for the last year has been in home building and housing related. I mean, the equity market sniffed out this change in the housing dynamic that we've seen throughout the country well, well before these numbers came in. And the good news is they still are suggesting that there is a very robust real estate market that remains and does not look like 2006, 2007, by the way, which I think is important and frankly refreshing. Well, you politely said it as uh, price can fib. John Burbank, who founded Passport Capital, famously said price is a liar. That's a little stronger. And you can get these misreads sometimes. And I think the central banks are quite vulnerable at times to looking at market prices especially of things like volatility and just misreading things like a 10 VIX in early 07 as the coast is clear, even though there's this epic leverage bubble in place. You also said something that really struck me, which is the November 2008 and then perhaps April 09, that the market was really better in some ways than maybe the indices were capturing. And I think that can go the opposite way as well. And this is where I really wanted to get your insights on the concentration that sits atop, let's say, the Qs or the S&P. I think the two competing eras were the tech bubble itself, a massive concentration in big caps, and perhaps some price destruction that was underneath the surface, not reflected in the level of the Qs. And maybe the early 70s was also just an incredibly top-heavy index. Is that the sort of thing that worries you, that The top five or six stocks in the queues get you maybe 45% of the market cap. What do you think about that? We've struggled with that one, looking at it historically in terms of the forward predictability. I mean, concentration in anything always makes me nervous. But in terms of timing it, I can't say that I've found the golden key to unlock that lock. What I would say historically, and it's been throughout my career, is when you're looking at the big top formations, 1999, 2000, 2007. When you look at the world the way that we look at it, which is stock by stock and breadth indicators and some of these different things, it's almost like a slow motion car wreck that it takes so much longer to develop that you're almost doubting yourself by the time it actually starts to develop. And what I mean is things like breadth. And I'll give you a contemporaneous example. Back in May, we had something like 93% of the S&P 500 was trading above its 200-day moving average. That's an extraordinarily good number. That was the highest number that we'd seen in, I think, decades, if I remember correctly. A lot of people would say, well, that's bearish because it's overbought. It's actually a really good sign that there's a lot of participation. But it represented, in our view, sort of what we'd expect to be peak data. Everything's going up, and that will not continue. And today, we're sitting here with about 82% of the names above their own 200-day moving average. So we've lost roughly 10%. And yet, the market continues to go on to make a new high. And that's been, let's call it, three months. That's sort of a blink of an eye in terms of sort of the divergences that you can have that start to develop where you have winners and losers, particularly when the Fed just starts to tighten or take away some of the nectar that's driven the rally. 
you start to get that differentiation. So what we're seeing today is something that we think will result in a consolidation, maybe a correction, but probably a consolidation, which is just sort of buying some time and then having a decent fourth quarter rally. Around that, though, is the question as as to whether or not that concentration continues. And so if we go on to 5,000 on the S&P, but we're talking about 60% 60% of the names in the S&P above their own 200-day moving average, those become extraordinarily dangerous types of environments. And those are the points where you're losing the support of sort of the average company, if you will, at just the propping up of some of these very select names, particularly the big cap names. And those become more dangerous. I have yet to find, again, that sort of magic bullet that says, hey, this concentration by itself represents a problem. It's usually the concentration becomes a reflection of the problem once that sort of marinates and you lose the leadership of the sort of, let's call it the average stock. That becomes the bigger issue then. Yeah, it's definitely interesting and certainly something we all should be watching. Let's shift as well to gold and then currencies. You mentioned currencies making its way into the types of signals that you look for. You've commented that gold and real yields have become disconnected. What do you see there? And then just more broadly, maybe first, how should investors think about gold in the context of just overall portfolio construction? When we look at portfolio construction, we look at relative performance, and then we go back and look and say, okay, look, within a range, how should we be thinking about things where an asset class provides you the upside or the protection, but doesn't become too much of a drag on the portfolio. And so relative performance becomes important. Now we volatility adjust that and do all these different things to create apples to apple types of comparisons. But right now, and a little bit of a head scratcher for me, because philosophically, and this is probably true for the last close to 10 years, philosophically, I'm a lot more bullish on gold than I am in terms of my actual positioning, which is zero at this point in time. But with the actions of the central bank, with the actions of what's happening globally, it just seems to be this persistent debasement of money. And that's nothing new, by the way, but it just seems to be on steroids here. You would expect philosophically that gold, silver, any of these things would be doing extraordinarily better, and they're not. So that's one of the things that I think is really a testament and an important part of portfolio management, which is the technical analysis piece, which is just saying, hey, look, whatever your philosophical biases may be, whether they're right or wrong, they might not be reflected in the market. And it just doesn't make a ton of sense to make big bets unless the market is giving you some sort of indication that it wants to participate in terms of your thinking. So I'm astonished with negative real yields where they are and the price action of gold. It just It's sort of inconsistent and incompatible. The way that I think about if I want to have exposure is I think about through your world, which is some type of derivative, low notional type of position, but just gives me the upside of the optionality to participate. But you know, in terms of relative performance, there's just nothing there. We're far bigger and have been far bigger in copper and tin and aluminum and steel because they just represent what's working in this environment. And I think that's a testament to the economy, which is as inflationary as it may be, it's not inflationary to the point of being non-productive. And gold becomes a much better asset when this money is being less productive. Right now, it seems to be productive enough to fire up the steel mills and to keep the economy generally humming. And so the delta is still in the industrial metals versus the precious metals. We'll see if that shifts, but there's really very little indication of that at this point in time. Well, I've always thought about portfolio construction in the context of finding those assets that can deliver some version of positive return, but also the way in which they react or interact from a correlation standpoint. It's critical, obviously, for your overall portfolio vol. And that's what's made things like the TLT or owning the 10-year such an incredible asset to sit alongside the S&P to produce positive return. We've obviously been in a 40-ish year bull market in bonds, but that negative correlation to the S&P is such a vol mitigator, even as it delivers positive returns. And gold has satisfied some version of that. And I would concur that it's breakdown versus real yields, and it's not really acting like the anti-S&P. Its correlation is really not defined right now. It's certainly not negative. It's hard to unfortunately get excited by it. And as you noted, as real yields came down and gold didn't go up, it really kind of had us scratching our heads and saying, well, what happens if yields go back up? (laughs) That's not going to be good for gold. What about FX? 
Talk to us about how your framework incorporates FX. How do you think about it technically? What are the maybe signals that you look for with respect to how you allocate from an equity standpoint? We obviously look at Forex. We don't spend a ton of time on it just to see if it confirms the way that we're thinking about the world. Or importantly, we want to make sure the sensitivity that you talk about to the 10-year yield, we do the same thing for the dollar as well. So we want to make sure that if we have a view on the dollar, and actually our view right here on the dollar is it's on the verge of actually a trend change breaking out. It's included about three quarters of the things that we look for to change trend, volatility contractions, and some of these things. It just needs to break out. It basically needs to get through. I think the number is 93.50 on the upside for the DXY. That would sort of confirm the double bottom. But we look at that in terms of as a sentiment gauge. And I think an important part of currencies and a really important part of free flow, particularly with quantitative easing and the like, is currencies are the pressure relief valve. The currencies are the gateway to expressing good or bad policies, both fiscal and monetary. And so when it used to be the gold standard, but now with interest rate suppression, and like, really what you end up with is having most of that expressed through the currency markets through appreciation or depreciation. So interestingly enough, and I think this is right now about the growth differentials, though historically the interest rate differentials are really, you know, if you were to take the four drivers of currencies historically from the textbooks, the Fisher effect, the international Fisher effect, the purchasing power parity, and the growth differentials, it's been all about the interest rate differentials. I mean, that's been a big, big part of the currency appreciation or depreciation. We're seeing some of that here, but I think most of it's coming from right now from growth. And the dollar actually looks pretty interesting to us. So with that, we just need to make sure that we understand those sensitivities to the dollar that we want to be aware of and cognizant of around the portfolio construction and moving away from some of the things like some of the cap goods, et cetera, as you get dollar appreciation, that becomes a little bit more challenging for those names. The question is, is do you get enough of a rise in the dollar to offset the rise in yields? That's where that sensitivity becomes important. We live in an aggressive environment for fiscal policy, perhaps to say the least. We're doing things we haven't tried before and spending more money on a deficit basis than we ever have. How does the policy side, I know you guys do focus on policy. How does that make its way into your thought process and what you recommend to clients? And are there things that you see through your analysis that folks just may be underappreciating from a either good or bad implication for markets? We rely on Steve Pavlik, our man in DC for that. And he's done a great job. And again, he's another treasury alum. So he understands sort of that linkage between policy and rates, and then obviously Wall Street and the impact there. I think as much as anything is the calendar, just understanding where are the hot buttons and the hot spots, if you will, in the policy calendar. And so right now is a great example where we're going to see in the coming weeks and probably I think it's early part of October, if I'm right on that, where there's going to be a conflict where the Democrats probably don't have the votes to get the big package done and a little bit of the tension that comes around there, the policy for a Christmas fiscal cliff. And so those are things, particularly for your world, that don't always get expressed on Wall Street as I think from a forward-thinking standpoint as they should, because they do create a lot of headlines, and those headlines create consternation, and you can sort of use that from a calendar perspective to pick it off. I haven't found, in fact, if, if anything, from a policy standpoint, there's a great indicator called the Policy Uncertainty Index, which is from out of Stanford, and I think it's- Baker Bloom. Bloom. Yeah. Baker Bloom and Yeah, Davis. Baker Bloom and Davis. And so what we find using the data- a lot of this, Dean, is contrarian. It's amazing how many negative coefficients you have, P-stats, with data. But that's a great one, which is the higher the policy uncertainty, the better the forward returns for equities. Now, going from where we are today, which is relatively low uncertainty, to that high uncertainty is bad news for the markets. But once you get to that high uncertainty, it actually tends to be really good news for the markets. And again, it gets us back to that idea that policymakers tend to sort of live off inertia until things get so bad that they have to sort of ratchet down and say, okay, we have to make a hard decision here. And I think there's an opportunity in the back half of the third quarter and probably early fourth quarter 
that there'll be some policy consternation that's probably not reflected in the market yet and might be opportunistic. So that's the way that we think about that. Well, I have two topics for us as we round out the call. The first is just to get you to think out loud about the valuation environment in which we live in broadly. Tech stocks, SPACs, NFTs, crypto, art. We live in a wealth bubble, real estate. And these things can go on for much longer than you think. And there's not necessarily some bad ending. But I'm just curious how you kind of think about the frothy or the juicy level of valuation in which we find ourselves. There's really five components that we think about when we think about equities and valuation, certainly one of them. I think one of the things here most recently that has been underappreciated is this 50 basis point decline that we've seen in the 10-year yield has actually provided some pretty good valuation support for the equity markets, particularly given second quarter earnings, where this has been one of the, if not the best, one of the best quarterly earnings numbers that we've ever seen. Now, obviously, we had massive multiples, so we're sort of growing into those. But six months ago, on this call, we would have been talking about the consensus looking for nothing but higher and higher and higher rates. And that's been just the opposite here in the last six months. So it's provided a little bit of cover from a valuation perspective. But that obviously makes a big difference to how the Fed operates and what's happening there and the sensitivity that we'll have around the balance sheets. But I think the thing that, and I'm loathe to presume that they don't see this. I think they do. I just don't know that they can talk about it, which is the Fed and the impact that they've had on this wealth creation. And then obviously the corollary to that is this idea of inequality, that those with the assets win and those without assets lose because of that wealth creation from rates. Right now, from the way that we look at the world within valuation, we don't have a really hard time with it. And what I will tell you historically, probably the worst indication is if you look at the market value of the Wilshire 5000 to GDP, that one is getting into a point that's relatively uncomfortable. But historically, we look at things like EBIT uh, enterprise value and the like and go through on an equal weighted basis. And there's a lot of different things. We could spend an hour talking about the different ways that you have to look at this. But keep in mind that the constituency of the indices change and the weightings change. Tech is now the largest proportion of the S&P 500. Well, back in 1980, it was energy and energy was about 23%. That has a much different capital structure. So the market's going to artificially look a lot cheaper then because of the weighting differentials between today and the early 1980s. So we meticulously go through and equal weight everything and sort of look at it so it's apples to apples so that we're not being skewed by what's happening to the overall sectors and industries and cap weightings around that. And what we find is that it's about 30% in total where valuation makes a difference, about 15% on the tail to the right and about 15% of the time on the tail to the left. And the rest of the time, the middle 70%, valuation just doesn't matter. And where we find ourselves right now is in that middle 70%. And so it is elevated to a certain degree on certain things, but relative to the other assets, it's not overly elevated. And that's sort of the world in which we live is not the absolute world, but the relative world. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing these Apollos and Blackstones and KKRs doing so well is because I think the relative valuation is not between equities and bonds. I think it's between private equity and equities and and bonds. And I think that's where the opportunity set still lies. And even commercial real estate, I mean, you're talking about cap rates of five to seven and a half percent, maybe higher in some of these things, which as compared to a 10-year treasury note at 130 basis points all day long, I'd take that with a little bit of inflation protection. So I think that's even got more to go, which is, if anything, probably a little bit more disconcerting than it is reassuring. You made the point that the recent rally in bonds in the face of rising inflation, as much of a head scratcher as that might be, was great for earnings. You capitalize forward cash flows back into very high cash flows when you have such a low discount rate. So it does make sense. And you also commented earlier just around assets that are not subjected to financial repression. Well, it certainly feels like the 10-year might be. And so a lot of that appears to be the linchpin for all of this. Well, I wanted to round out our conversation and just get some of your perspectives as someone running a business and a client-focused business. So this last 18 months has been kind of hell for the world and just difficult in so many ways. Thankfully, we've made a fair amount of progress. We've gotten the economy back to life. There's clearly some scars 
from COVID that are ongoing. But with respect to running a business and specifically connecting with clients through that period and in the aftermath of that period, I was just hoping you could share some of your observations on just that connectivity part. You mentioned not being able to travel as much earlier in the call. What is it like now running a client-focused business versus a couple of years ago in, again, the aftermath of COVID? I think COVID, and I'm such a huge proponent of inertia and just inertia in everyday life, whether it's your relationships, whether it's your business, whether it's your workout at the gym, whatever it is, like inertia just becomes such an important part of our lives. And there was a lot of the way Wall Street worked was really a byproduct in my mind of inertia. And well before COVID, in fact, we had a mandate for our salespeople to do more of these Zoom calls. We use GoToMeeting, but the same concept. And the reason being that we still want to get out and see people because I think it's important. And this is still a person-to-person business and trust is obviously paramount in this business. So you have to see people. But at the same time, for us, it felt like the client experience was so much better when we could talk about what they wanted to talk about instead of going out and having a 50-page handout to talk about what we thought was important how can we talk about what the client wanted to talk about? And obviously, it's much easier when you can share a screen and you have your Bloomberg. And we have a very extensive database of our proprietary work that we can talk around things specifically that the client wants to talk about. So you might have somebody who at 10 a.m. wants to talk about semiconductors or maybe tech, and then at 11 wants to talk about nothing other than consumer discretionary. And now you can do that and you can do it effectively and do it in less than an hour, do it in 20 minutes and have more of those conversations that are in depth and have a better intimacy to them and obviously have a purpose that is more client oriented than it is just happens to be what we want to talk about is we're making the trip to that town or that city the one time that we go every six to nine months. So I think it's actually been a better way to engage with customers in a more meaningful way. And as much as I still like to travel and get out to see people, I think it's actually been better for the business to see that giving customers what they want. And that in the end is obviously the most important part of running a business. That's excellent. Well, listen, I'm glad, Jeff, we got the chance to do this. I know we've been talking about it for a long time. So thank you very much for being a guest. It was great to hear the insights and learn a little bit more about your framework. Thanks again. Dean, thank you. These have been great. I've listened to every single one of them and hopefully this one can contribute. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time.